Liberty-minded librarians know that you are not what you read. Welcome back to Good News Next Week, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more for MediaMonarchy.com. Good News Next Week is the new spinoff series from New World Next Week, where we celebrate ways that we are winning. We've got that Book Smarts story coming up, plus a word about Walmart. But first, 42% of Americans ditch the two-party system and say government is the biggest problem. This via our friend Claire Burnish with an article posted on the anti-media. More people in the United States than ever are breaking away from the political duopoly by refusing to identify as either Democrat or Republican, and they now effectively compromise the true silent majority, independence. According to a Gallup poll released Monday for 2015, just 29% of respondents call themselves Democrats, while 26 identify as Republicans, but fully 42% say nay to both parties and claim to be independents, down only marginally from 43% last year. Indeed, independents as a group reached 40% of the population for the first time in 2011 and have comprised at least that percentage since then. Before Gallup polling began by phone in 1988, there were several years when the average percentage of Republican identifiers was lower than 25%. But for Democrats, that self-identification reached a 27-year low, down from the previous year's 30%, and because data from 1951 to 1987 collected in person never found a yearly average Democratic identification less than 37%, it is, quote, safe to conclude that the current 29% is also the lowest in Gallup polling history, end quote. When pressed further, 16% of the independents admitted leaning Democratic, and another 16% admitted a Republican tendency, evidencing the weight of the two-party system on voters' feelings, as Gallup pointed out, because in most elections, voters are asked to choose a candidate from one of the two parties. What could explain this virtual nadir in party identification? As Claire Burnish writes, it's the government, stupid. For the second year in a row, exasperation with the government topped the U.S. populace's list of pressing grievances in a separate Gallup poll. They named it as the nation's number one problem more often than the ubiquitous economy. In fact, of the last 15 years, the economy was the top complaint eight times, including each of the six years prior to the government itself taking first place in 2014. With party fervor inevitably headed for a crescendo with the 2016 presidential selection race in full swing, perhaps the lackluster red and blue loyalty evidences the precursor to a shift. Imagine the possibilities should this silent growing majority decide to cast votes outside the two-party platform. Maybe, just maybe, these independents have begun to see the duopoly for what it is, two sides of the tarnished coin. The same tarnished coin, but I know, I know. This time it'll be different, right? Our main story this week and second story this week on Good News Next Week, libraries deleting data to protect privacy. This via The Guardian. Last week with a little fanfare, the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, CUNY, did something very few private companies would ever do to protect its users' privacy. It quietly began to purge its interlibrary loan records. Quote, this policy change is motivated by the idea that libraries should not keep more information about their users' requests than necessary, end quote, wrote Beth Posner, head of library resource sharing at the school. We will continue to keep all requests from 2013 forward until further notice. Eventually, we will only keep a rolling history of one year or less, though, in order to ensure that all interlibrary loan requests remain confidential, she told students at the faculty in email. Previously, you could find a list of everything you ever requested through interlibrary loan. Perhaps that sounds like harmless information, but Polly Thistlethwaite, chief librarian at the Graduate Center, said that guilt by association with controversial books has a long history and that librarians have a duty to protect readers of quote-unquote heretical texts. Most librarians would say that you are not what you read, Thistlethwaite said. You are not the material you look at but others have disagreed. There's also really bad police work, she observed. Recently, it's become more common to try and force librarians to turn over user information and compel their silence simultaneously. Multiple librarians have pushed back against national security letters, NSLs, that would do just that in the name of public safety, a dangerous order to resist, since those letters include a gag order. But in 2005, when the FBI served a national security letter to Connecticut's Library Connection, 
Demanding reader records and hard drives, the librarians resisted with such force that the government capitulated. The American Library Association had their backs, resolving unanimously to, quote, condemn the use of national security letters to demand any library records, end quote. As the use of the law to acquire patron records since the Patriot Act has increased, librarians have become some of the U.S.'s most foremost experimenters in data security. Now they're doing something even the most security-conscious private firm would never dream of, but have often been encouraged to do by security experts, purging sensitive information in order to protect their users. Thistlethwaite says there was nothing burning that prompted the loan record purge. It was simply the best practice and one that many in the government and in private industry have been loath to adopt. How many times do we see now in our New World Next Week archives when we're talking good news? A lot of times we talk about libraries and we talk about those ways that connect your community with the knowledge we all want and need and all deserve to share with each other. So love that story. And we close with a word about Walmart. We'll take it from USA Today. Walmart to close 269 stores and shut down some of their express formats. Walmart will close 269 stores around the world in a strategic move to focus more on its super centers and e-commerce business, the company said Friday. The closure includes 154 U.S. locations, encompassing Walmart's entire fleet of 102 express format stores, its smallest locations meant to compete with dollar stores, which have been in pilot testing since 2011. Some super centers, Sam's Club locations, and neighborhood markets, you gotta love the euphemistic language, will also close, plus 115 stores in Latin American markets. The closures were decided based on financial performance and how well the locations fit with Walmart's broader strategy, said Greg Hitt, company spokesman. Walmart's been working aggressively to grow its e-commerce presence and digital services, plus upgrade stores and provide shoppers with a more blah 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 pleasant experience. In that vein, the company's been making a big push to increase wages and provide more training to employees, an, efforts that, an effort that's costing more than a billion dollars to pay people right. God. The store closures, which represent less than 1% of global revenue from Walmart's nearly 11,600 stores worldwide, will allow the retailer to step up its digital and in-store initiatives, Hit said. Meanwhile, in a statement, Walmart CEO Doug McMillan said the company is, quote, committed to growing, but we are being disciplined about it, end quote. Walmart plans to open more than 300 stores in the coming fiscal year. This is one of those not unmitigated good news stories that James and I have covered in the past where it's kind of good, but it also has potentially a whole lot of bad with it as well. Walmart has destroyed towns and neighborhoods and ran all those mom and pops out of business. Can they come back? Will they come back? Will they be left now once Walmart leaves town? A gutted ghost town? Perhaps. But hopefully this can lead to a new surge in local markets in these hundreds of towns where now Walmarts are leaving. We take a quick look at some of our good news next week headlines. Switzerland returns $380 million in looted funds to Nigeria. Monsanto scraps $90 million GM corn facility due to declining profits and the return of the incandescent bulbs as MIT makes them more efficient than LEDs. Submit your good news with the hashtag good news next week, and please support our independent, non-commercial work at MediaMonarchy.com support. This has been Good News Next Week. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com, reminding you, as always, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. <laughs>